are you doing? How are you doing, man? Hi, Jan. I'm fine. It's been a while. And it's a pleasure to talk to you. Tell me, man. How How is the situation? What is going on in... Everywhere, actually, is stretching you. <laughs> how are you surviving? I am good. I cannot complain. I am, to be honest, I think I am privileged. I have a job. I am healthy. So seeing what's happening around the world, to be honest... You have to be pretty much, pretty much happy with what we have to keep what we have. But of course, it's a different new normality. My life has changed a lot, like everybody else. So it's, I'm coping with it. So no, no complaints. Could be, could be better. Could be worse. Yeah, we all could probably say it. We're lucky, lucky ones, of course. Uh, but tell me, how was it for you, like the 2020 in general? Because you left Rye this year and yeah. after 10 years, so that's a big change. Yeah. It, it is a big change. It is a big change. I need. I think that 10 years in Rye was a great experience professionally, but I needed, you know, new challenge professionally. So I had the luck, I would say, the privilege to join Facebook. Uh, as a company and I'm working I moved also to London so I changed my life quite dramatically besides besides job personal life um, professional so a lot of changes in 2020 and then a pandemic <laughs> so it's uh, that that was a cherry on top of the cake I would say so changing changing everything in the middle of this has been quite a challenge but then again I, I like challenges yeah, but do you miss the, the, the recent job you had to be, to be in head of delegation? No, I, I, I do not miss it, to be honest. I cherish the moment that I had as an head of delegation, all the journey that we do uh, in the Eurovision, but uh, I don't miss it. I think I needed, I needed a new challenge, and 10 years is a very long time, professionally, especially when you are between your 30 and your 40, and you you need to... To grow professionally, you also need to to change. So, I needed I, I needed that. You didn't feel that that there's an opportunity to do such a thing in Rai? Uh there is. But if you wanna, Rai as any public broadcaster is a complicated, say slightly more complicated than normal company. So, you never know how things go. And I wanted to work in the private sector. I wanted to jump, uh, to have an experience with the tax. So there, there it is. Broadcasting. I think I I had enough w with broadcasting experience. I wanted to to learn new stuff. Yeah, there's probably a lot of pressure in Italy on television professionals in general. But how was it in your position? But more pressure. What What you mean? Uh, political uh, I mean, pressure? Or? No, I mean like pressure that that you're a producer. You're doing big TV shows, things, and. Mm, maybe the public yeah, pressure, a, like the pressure in general. I didn't mean any, any. Exactly. Yeah, Rai, yeah, Rai, Rai is a, as I said, is a very complicated, uh, it's a very complicated company. There is a lot of pressure on the company from every angle. It's still uh, the, one of the leading media companies in Italy, so the attention in it is unprecedented, like any other company. Whatever Rai does. Every day you will read in in the news, so it's uh, let's say it's a stressful job, and I wanted to get out a little bit of of these and work in a more in a in in a different setting. Let's put it like this. Yeah, how much of this pressure, stress was put into Eurovision? How how what is the reputation of Eurovision in Italy? You know, I, I think you know the story that your region was... When I joined in 2011, 2011 when Italy joined, uh, your region was virtually unknown in Italy. Nobody nobody knew about it, nobody cared, nobody... So the pressure... It was it was easy for me in a way... It was easy and difficult for me in a way because it was difficult to pull out resources because it was not considered a priority project, so it was marginal. So having resources, resources internally in the company was difficult. I had to do the first few years, I had to do so many things alone. I think I was the tiniest delegation ever in the history of the Eurovision. In, in, a, in the first years we were like, besides the, the singers and uh, you know some people from the record label, I think we were from Rai, it was only me. So you can imagine how much work was delegated on me. It was it was crazy, crazy, and I was also inexperienced about the Eurovision. So for me, it was the first few years were quite a 
crash course. Um, then year after year, the let's say the reputation of the Eurovision grew, the perception of it grew, and I think that now is in a very good place. I mean, given where we started, so I, I have to say that I'm very proud of what I've left. Uh, if I look back and I think of where I started and where Eurovision was when I left, I think it is a very nice. Uh, very nice accomplishment. I'm I'm really really proud of the work we have done with all the team, not only me of course, with all the team there. Yeah, you must definitely be proud as as you're not just the best of the big five countries. If I can say the result says it as well, but as well you you were one of the best countries in general. You know, in Eurovision for for few years, definitely from the time I was started in Eurovision a few years ago. And it's very inspirational as well. And tell me how much this inspiration was connected to San Remo. San Remo. Yeah, I think I think to be honest that I was one of the luckiest head of delegation because I had the most advanced, the biggest, and the most established selection mechanism in Europe. I mean. There's nothing like Saremo in any of the, I mean I know the broadcasting scene the public broadcaster more important scene in Europe quite well uh having you know being in the in the international relations for so long in in Rai and there's nothing like Saremo so established so powerful in Italy Saremo is massive it's 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 way bigger than the Eurovision it's it's a show that really collects the energy of the country for months and the week of Sanremo is like 50% share with 12, 13 million people every night and having that thing, having that thing as a sort of um, foundational work for what we would do in the Eurovision after, it's, it's, a, it's a great luck and my job was much easier. I didn't, I didn't have the, let's say, the responsibility ultimately to choose the artist because Italy was choosing it. And Italy, for real, is not like any small talent show or selection process that is is marginal. Whoever wins Remo has got really the whole country backing him up and all this energy, in a way, translate to, to, to the Eurovision uh, after. So I think I had a huge competitive advantage um, compared to my to my fellows uh, head of delegation and whenever i whenever i looked at the struggle that all the countries had with establishing the proper selection model whether it was an internal selection or where it was you know some custom made show or using existing talent like the the i don't know the x factor or the voice i mean i had in on my hand the perfect the perfect framework to 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 work with and then again it, it was much easier and the results i think that the results that italy achieved in in this 10 years which were remarkable in terms of consistency most importantly uh where are probably 70 percent 80 percent merit of sarremo and not, not probably mine or for the teams there are Two things I would like to ask in regards to San Remo. First is that the the, the winner of San Remo is not automatically chosen for Eurovision, or he can he, he or she they can decline, isn't it? Yeah. And the second thing yeah. is from San Remo, the winners or not just the winners, but the the people who are representing you in past decade, they were always bringing something different, something not which I wouldn't say it's Eurovision. Why isn't this spirit affecting mo most countries? That's to be honest, I don't know. So uh, let's go back to your first to your first question first. Um, in the rules uh, that we have had, and I think it was the same for two thousand and twenty, but I because I think it hadn't been changed. Uh, but I had I had left Rai already when the rules of Saremo were drafted. Um, the winner of the main league of Saremo Saremo is two leagues. Uh, we we call it Campione in Italian, which like established artist that would translate and then newcomers and the winner of the established artist um has the right to represent italy for the eurovision but of course we cannot we cannot force him to uh, because saremo is independent saremo is not 
at all made functionally for the Eurovision. We just think that Owen Sanremo is the, probably the most suitable artist and the most entitled artist to represent um, Italy in, in, in such a big mainstream competition as Eurovision is. I didn't mean uh, the influence of Sanremo in general, but the influence of Italian artists. They bring, you know, all of the all of your representatives, all of your acts were really, really original, really original songs, really original sounds, mostly considered as a uh, favorites of the Eurovision. And they didn't send like what I like to say Eurovision song. Never. Yeah, but but but, but then again, because Sanremo is the, the songs the songs that are uh uh, let's say selected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, for why, Sanremo, why don't you think not... it didn't influence others? You know, not to send so-called Eurovision songs. To, to be honest, I don't, I don't know, and I find it very silly when most people talks about Eurovision re recipes or Eurovision songs. Or so I, I think it's a, I think a song has to be a song. An artist has to be sincere. An artist has to have something to tell. And I think this was ultimately our strength, uh, most of the cases. Wh whatever, whatever, let's say the genre we were bringing was, because we, we have done, we've come with Il Volo, then we've done with Mengoni, which was an Italian ballad, then Gabbani, Gabbani with a more ironic, uh, ironic twist, uh, then, I don't know, Mahmoud with a completely urban and more contemporary, contemporary genre. So according to... I think that the only common thing that there is between those those entries is that those entries are real. Those entries are written, most of the times are even written by the singers, and they're written because they had some those singers had something to say and they wanted to express them artistically. They're not thought. There's absolutely not a thought behind let's do what works in Eurovision. What is the oh it has to be an up tempo. Yeah, you have to be you have to have a great ending with a big note then you have the in the middle of the song where does the after the bridge you need to have the key change to make it more into all this kind of discussion were never considered like at all the discussion was what about what wanted the art what what the artist wanted to bring to Sanremo and this is what you know normally how this works and whenever a song wants Sanremo then we know that the majority of Italians liked it, and I'm sure that if the Italians liked it, also the uh, other other people from other nationality liked it. Something that I remember I've discussed a lot with with my friends from head of delegation was when they were sending some random artists that sometimes they didn't at all represent the let's say, the reality of the recording industry in those countries. Take the example of the UK, where they have probably the most thriving um, recording business in, in, in the world. And, and then some really random artists were there that nobody knew about, nobody cared. They say, and I was telling them, look, if, if the, the British people don't even... And I don't, don't want to... I just use the UK as a generic... Uh, example, probably the most extreme. If your public does not care about this song and this artist, how do you expect that Italians, French, uh, Czechs, or Portuguese people will care about this? So this is a matter. If you don't even believe in what you're bringing, how do you expect other countries to believe in it? So this is a matter. For me, it's a very simple equation. It's like you need to bring something that is real in your country, that has success in your country that people back up, that people love. And if this happens, be sure that the song will go well. Then, of course, you can be unlucky. Sometimes variables are strange and you never know how, how ultimately the, the ranking goes. But be sure that if something is very successful in your country, this will translate also into the Eurovision stage. This is how I believe it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to, to it that I'll, I'll share I probably sign, you know, 100% of what you just said. And I will just add that I just don't think that it's necessary for the artist to be known. As, like, it's different no. from Italy, from the UK as well, when you can just catch someone on the street and he's probably is a great musician, you know, how extreme it is. But I think you need to have this kind of 
story behind it, what you said, the, 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 the artists from San Remo, San Remo, they don't really care about Eurovision, so they write something they really would like to sing. To bring or they, yeah. they work on something with the team of, on what they want to, how they want to profile themselves. And I think that's, that can be the key, how to grow Eurovision at all, if, if all of the countries are doing it in general, or put it into the competition or consideration. Especially the big consider, five countries. Consider, consider that the songs, let's say the songs of Sanremo dominates in Italy the charts. Let's say that five, seven songs of Sanremo dominates the charts in Italy for a couple of months. There is a huge pressure from the record industry, uh, recording industry around Sanremo, and this is one of the biggest moments they have uh, around the year. So whatever gets to Sanremo, be sure that as gone through a lot of thoughts, a lot of, you know, processing, a lot of production before. So the, what goes to Saremo has to be successful because the recording, you know, the record labels are investing so much money in it that they really want this to be successful. And of course, that as I told you, this, this automatically translates. Then you can be, it can be more, it can be less, when it translates to the Eurovision, sometimes the culture, the language, so many elements also add. But then again, also, Saremo is a huge mainstream platform and Eurovision is a huge mainstream platform. And they're a TV show, they're not music. I mean, they're not only music competition. So also we need to take into account, into, into account this element, I think, in the, whole, in the whole thing. How hard was for artists to... To sing with the back vocalist behind and not the live music when San Remo is based on live music, isn't it? Yeah, San Remo is all live, they sing with the orchestra. Most of the time though they do have a different uh, musical arrangement uh, for the... San Remo has a spe special, let's say, arrangement for the show that is done from the show because sometimes then the backing, backing tracks of the songs are way more, let's say way more contemporary or no, I wouldn't say contemporary is not the word problem is they have a range of sounds which are not easily replicable with the orchestra with a, with a live orchestra so what they do normally is they have these two versions of the songs one for Saremo with a or, 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 or um, with the orchestra arrangement and then of course the, the backing track which is the one that is used uh, that is used in, in Saremo and that and that they will normally use for other shows or for promotions and for things like this. That is also the uniqueness of Saremo because sometimes the orchestratic version adds something magical to the song and it's way more difficult to sing with an orchestra than with a backing track I can assure you that. Yeah. For sure, but it's probably even hard to do the TV show like this when everything can go wrong So many on so many levels, it's much harder yeah, probably. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, how hard is to work with Italian artists? Aren't they suffer with this like prima donna, <sighs> you know? Uh... Uh, I have to say, I have to say that this is probably the only downside of uh, of bringing very relevant artists because as I said all those artists that win Sanremo are artists that are very well known in the Italian musical scene they have huge entourages and sometimes and, and I think you know very well this the, the entourage of an artist can be intense there are so many stakeholders sometimes there are personal manager assistants makeup artists uh, friends, uh, uh, record label managers, all those people that, that comes with you and they want, they, they have an opinion about everything, sometimes not necessarily the most informed opinion, sometimes out of stereotypes, out of random, random things. And it's, and it's very difficult to, because those artists are, the, the, let's say that the more famous they are, the bigger star they are, the more layers around them they have. So it's very difficult to make sure that, that they get the proper information and that they understand what is happening sometimes. And well... It, 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 it has been, a few years it has been intense, let's say. Especially the first year. 
No, not the first years. The first years were e was easier because it was less pressure. Also in the national, let's say, the, the national relevance of Eurovision was so minor that the artists were there without too much pressure from and media attention from, from the Italian media. And of course, they care mostly because their market mostly is in Italy. So they care a lot how they, you know, they have a lot. To, let's put it this way. They have a lot to lose. Uh, uh, an upcoming artist who goes to Eurovision selected randomly and nobody knows about has nothing to lose going to Eurovision. Everything is like a theme park and it's a world of op opportunities. If you are established, if you have like a solid career with several albums on your on your shoulders, going to Eurovision and uh, let's say getting a very bad position is 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 humiliating in in a way. I, I don't think it's humiliating, but. From, uh, let's say, from an established artist's point of perspective, it is complicated. So it, it, this, this, let's say that this sort of stress has increasingly became bigger and bigger as long as the Eurovision was growing bigger and bigger in Italy. In the last few years, there was so much pressure, so much attention, so much media, so many Italian journalists coming that in the previous year we didn't even we didn't have that. Of course, things become more complicated. Then it means that more, uh, you know, communication manager, more um, assistants, more whatever they needed to tackle with the, to tackle this, were joining the delegation and more opinions, more heads. Yeah. <laughs> more, heads. more more has more opinions that sometimes tend to talk even to stagings which bro in my opinion oh. wasn't the best if the music was the best the stagings probably wasn't the best thing on italian acts yeah i think yeah, that this that, is and do you I think that that, you. that that was the that was the factor that that you didn't win the eurovision in this decade <laughs> To be honest, I don't know uh, if that was a factor. For sure, it was a weak spot, and you're totally right. Um, the reason of these is multiple factors. Some there was a big cultural issue there because most of the artists didn't want to do a big numbers. Uh, they didn't. They didn't because they thought that the simplicity as as there is in Saremo Saremo deliberately don't have state doesn't have staging it's just the orchestra and few few customization but it's very limited um and costumes yeah and and costumes and and they don't sometimes they feel they felt that they didn't want to, to do much i think this has also has changed a little bit in the years in the last few years this notion also in the the problem was also with the manager with the recording with the record labels they didn't want to cooperate that much on this on this path they thought that bringing exact whatever was in Sanremo exactly the same replica would work and this we know that this necessarily doesn't unless in very few cases um so i, I don't know whether ultimately this was was the reason why we didn't win but for sure for sure it was a weak spot believe me and every year i got very very much frustrated with the staging like it was a uh, had so many headaches trying to convince them to deliver and another issue was that after sarremo immediately after sarremo they become in a in in a complete the, all the artists that win gets in a crazy crazy uh media media schedule so they have concerts they have interviews they have tv shows and the time between between the uh let's say the saremo which is normally in the middle of february and the head of delegation meeting which is in the middle of march they it, it's impossible to get hold of the artists it's impossible to sit with them and discuss because they have priorities because they have so many things to do in Italy where they actually sell albums and I, I also I have to respect and understand it. So it also that was another another issue. They don't have the time to sit and start discussing about the you know the staging. They see May as something super far away and they don't understand that in March we have to deliver such an amount of material. Even though I explain them i explained to all the record labels beforehand everyone's in sure understanding sure sure but the moment the win sanremo 
they get in this this wheel of craziness that these things get deprioritized. So it's May. It's May. We will see when when it comes. See, it doesn't work like this. <laughs> it's like in May we cannot change anything anything anymore. But you know, it, it's been a battle, like truly, truly, truly a, a battle for me to to get the staging done in time and. And, and and that was the most excruciating part of the Eurovision for me. Yeah, bro. I think for most of us, as this, you know, to in Czech Republic there is no traditional staging as well. In different way, of course, a different context, but no none. And to to tell the artist uh, how what's possible, what's not possible, what not to do, what to do. And still let them influence it as they will go on stage. That yeah, was exactly. the hardest, hardest part. And I think not just artists are not don't understand, but the, the the other people who didn't ever try to deliver, you know, those all sheets and scripts and ideas and transcript it to the others who will be doing it, you know, and the but, people but who did, will but, be but, rehearsing but, it. That's crazy. But I remember you did some like super nice stage and i think it was lisbon what was the one with all the colors and the different shots uh oh, was it lisbon all of it <laughs> oh. no there was something i, I don't remember now that i don't remember now that the, the song I, I will come up into my mind but i remember one super cool cool stage yeah that was a boy that. with the with the backpack or the last year with the frames the, which were I, I think both I think both the backpack and the backpack was super cool and uh, also the frames I love particularly so I I found it was very I mean you you did a much better job than I did about staging so <laughs> like I can assure you that it doesn't matter the results weren't that, that, that's that great and that brings me to this big big five appearance you know the the history of Italy the, the new history of Italy at Eurovision is not not so huge and yet you become the best like far best country in it and I I'm not sure if it's just because of San Remo but maybe there's something special how does the other big five countries just watching you and telling you like how is it possible how like what, shouldn't be called like one big country and four smaller big ones <sighs> I, I to be honest I I don't know I I think there are, it's a mixture of variables. First of all, I think that I had luck to start with a clean slate. There was not there was not history about the Eurovision. So there was not let's say the Eurovision in the Eurovision also has changed a lot in in the last in the last decade in in for the for the better. If I remember, if I look back at when I look back at some of the shows in the early two thousand, to be honest, the quality of the music music offering was very very poor, and I understand that these years might have influenced it in big countries like the UK, like France or Spain, where then again the artists had so much artists had potentially a lot to lose. Uh, I I can understand that this could create a sort of negative spiral about ab, ab, about participating to the Eurovision. So basically, for me, it works like this: it's good artists doesn't want to go to Eurovision because they think it's trashy. They don't think it's up to their level. So a bad artist is chosen. The bad artist or a bad artist or not it's not it's not a fair word like not a successful artist or not the the best option is chosen so this option clearly will not go well in Eurovision and will become last or in the in the last in the last few few ranks and then the last year this whole spiral is even worse because the artist would look look that one even that one got so low and has been publicly humiliated in the press in our country blah 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 and so it's a spiral that for many years creates an, an halo of negativity around 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 the contest i didn't have that so i started in 2011 and i think that the level of the production of the dusseldorf edition was impressive it's like it was like an astonishing show and 
And year after year, things started to go better and better. The show was getting better. The, the entries were getting better, more credible, more contemporary, less of a joke ads and, 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 thing, and things like this. So I think it helped, it helped me building. I had luck with some of the few artists at the beginning. So, you know, getting second immediately, we, we reached the second place immediately in 2011. So it became a sort of, I, I had the luck of having, the opposite was a positive spiral. So the more the more you go well, the better it, it the media portrays them in, in your own countries and the easiest is to get good artists to, to join. So I think that this is my for me, for Italy specifically it's a combination of it's a combination of luck. And I think also there is a small percentage of things that people tend to like music in Italian. Besides, besides probably English, Italian is one of the most commonly accepted music, music language in Europe. Uh, as, even, even if you're Russian or if you're Portuguese, a song or in Czech. Italian will, yeah. or Czech will not sound too strange to you, while probably a song in German or Albanian might not sound appealing because because of the, the language, uh, even even though there might be the super top songs, but yeah, there or, or we all rose rose up on on Eros Ramazzotti, so that's maybe the reason. Yeah, exactly. There is there is a sort of mainstream uh, habit of consuming music in Italian that helps probably. What do you think about Deodato's chances? I loved I loved Diodato. I don't know the chances because I stopped predicting. You know, I I remember when when we went in Kiev with Gabani and everybody was saying you're winning, you're winning, you're winning. You have no idea how much I had organized in ride because I was preparing everyone. Look, I was telling, look, we we might win this, so let's be prepared and meeting budgets. I I wanted to. I was also in the reference group, so of course I had this sort of double responsibility that if I won, I wanted. You know my company to be prepared and informed and not arrive there like Alice in Wonderland and now what? So yeah, I, I think I spent six months, no six months, four months since Gabani was selected in Saremon and we immediately went up in the in the in the odds. I spent like four crazy months, and then we didn't win. And then when I go back to Rai, I had all the you know the executives and me. Win, 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 and then and, and talk, talk to me like this. So I don't make any predictions anymore. But I have to say that Diodato, I, I found that song so moving, so touching. I still listen to it. It's a song that I like, and it's so lovable. It's such, I mean, he's such a lovable person, such an easygoing person that I would, I, I would have loved to work with him. I think we would have clicked very well. Uh, everybody who worked with him loves him. Uh, and the song was so powerful, so moving, and so it. it th then again, he wrote that song. He felt that song. That song was written for his ex lover. Uh, you know that actually she was competing in Sanremo as well. Uh, fun enough. Um, and uh, you know, I I think you can see when something is real. You might not like the genre, you might not like that type of Italian classic pop song, you might like also, but you can sense the unique, not the uniqueness, the reality, the, the, the truth in what is singing. Yeah, I always say that it's the feeling which you can't describe, but it's something like you, you, you can touch it somehow, you, you just... Exactly, It exactly. just somehow works, somehow, you don't know the spirit, you don't even yeah. think about it, it's there. It's there. It's it it it's, it gets to you. It speaks to you. It 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 it, it arrives into your heart in in a way or another. At least to me. I I, and I think. Have you have you watched the video when he's singing in the Arena di Verona alone? Uh, that and, that was like, yeah. that was beautiful. That was moving. That that was for me. That was art in a in a pop way. But that was art. And I think that these. Uh, he would have he would have done very well to be honest. I don't know winning or not. I don't. I I cannot possibly tell. But for sure, the viewers would have felt that 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 is something is there. That is something real is there. And I think that this ultimate ultimately is the, is the key. Yeah. If you have. 
if you yeah, have it, it, it ultimately worked with, 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 with Italian acts or I remember the same thing. Yeah, exactly. This is something that I think the only the only real for me Eurovision recipe is this that an artist is truth to himself. It is is going there to to do what he would do everywhere else. And 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 this transfers somehow to to the public. Yeah, I would like to see more more artists and acts and songs and selections like this actually. So uh so uh, how hard probably is for Diodato that that there probably be selection again from somehow yeah. so so he wouldn't yeah, I, he won't I don't, compete. I don't think, no, Diodato for I mean I, I'm not sure if we will enter Saremo again. Normally, if you win Saremo the year before, you don't go the year after. You tend not to statistically, but this is a very weird year. So God knows what is going to happen. Uh, God knows if Saremo will still be there as well. Like, I don't know if they will. They're just. I I read somewhere in the news that they were discussing how to do it if they do in you know, in some other formats if the COVID um, crisis is not is not solved. And February unfortunately seems very close for that. Um, but I I I. What I understood, and then again, I cannot confirm you hundred percent because I'm I'm I I I decided to take a break from all Rai and Eurovision matters. Uh, I think that they will choose a new artist in Saremo. So whoever will win Saremo again this year will go. So that 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 is my understanding. Yeah. Well, would you say to Diodato if if you're still in the position of the head of delegation and say like, man? <laughs> It's Sorry. a very complicated discussion to to make. Luckily, I did not have to do that. <laughs> so I'm I'm happy not to not to be the one who have who has to deliver this news. Well, actually, you know, you you were a part of the reference group, which which has some responsibilities and the decision making. How can you describe how is it? As the fans, they are making a lot of speculations about. What's going on there? And, they, yeah, and I think they, sometimes even like few of us make some speculations. You know what's going on there. So what's going on there? Yeah. Look, the the rapper group for me has been an incredible experience. I've learned so much, and I. It's difficult. It's a difficult group. It's a difficult job, because you have to accompany the. Host broadcaster all year. We meet round seven times per year, but of course we work offline most of the time just to uh, to make sure that we progress on things when we 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 can we could not physically meet of course. And for as much as your vision every year is repeat itself in in its liturgy there are some things that are the same the production challenges are similar the let's say the deadlines are similar whatever there are so many things that change from country to country so many political issues so many uh, problems with the sponsors because then again one of the biggest mission of the uh the reference group is to make sure that we monetize everything that we can just to make the show more sustainable for the host broadcaster because it costs a lot of money broadcasters across europe are not in the best shape <laughs> say especially public broadcasters um so we have to make sure that every possible uh let's say monetization opportunities there that sometimes clashes with the ambition of the broadcaster at some point at some level so it's it's a constant um research of a common ground which is difficult when you have 42 stakeholders from 42 different culture with 42 different ways of seeing things uh even if you want to put, for example, I take you to I give you a very concrete example. There wasn't the opportunity of putting some banners in the brake bumpers. These banners would consistently increase the revenues that we would get from the sponsor. Uh, some logos, sorry, not some banners uh, in in the in the brake bumpers. These logos would 
consistently increase the revenue that ultimately allows the host broadcaster to spend less money, which is the priority to make this as sustainable for the future as possible. Getting these things approved by certain countries who have a very strict policy around sponsorship and regulation, it was crazy adventure. So you have to work obsessively about this kind of stuff. Then you have political tensions between countries, then you have sanctions that sometimes you have to do when uh, some countries do not respect the, you know, the, the nature of the Eurovision rules, then you have how you educate all the countries that delays are really impacting the production because you need to make sure that everybody delivers the same. You, I think you remember very well how pressing all the deadlines are, but these deadlines are set in a very, uh, let's say, assertive way because you have to make sure that the production has the bigger picture. Even though it seems unfair from a single point of view, single country point of view, because, you know, yeah, but in my country this year I had this, this, this and that, and this affected my production. So every time it's about negotiating, finding a common ground, listening to what are the needs of the single, the single countries and the single broadcaster, but you have to find a common ground around everything, and it's difficult. And, what, and, was the, what was and, the worst, worst kind of case you, you were dealing with? Uh, well, to be honest, Ukraine, Russia. I mean, the Ukraine experience has been really all over the place. It's been the meetings. I mean, I, I, I'd rather not get too much in, into that, but the amount of meetings that, and, and the craziness that there was around the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian year, uh, it, it's been it's been crazy. It's been something I will hardly forget. It's been extremely interesting from a professional point of view because it was a learning experience. But I had never I had never worked so extensively with a former Soviet country. <laughs> the, the the logics, the, the the processes, and actually I am impressed. And this is Yonola's. I have to really. We we all as also as fans as head of delegation as as people we have to build like a massive statue to Yonola because if it it hadn't been for Yonola's stamina for Yonola's very Nordic and Scandic cold blood um, to to push things forward probably the, the the Eurovision in Kiev would have never happened because up until the fir- up until the first the the last weeks. Everything was so messy, so complicated, so and the, because the television there, the public broadcaster was so tiny and so not prepared for that that the EBU has to the EBU had to do like three times what they normally would do to make it happen, and and, and you know that happens. and you know yeah and it happened and it was successful probably not the best edition that I recall but still a pretty decent and fair edition um impressively so because i didn't I, I i you know up until the very end we were so like oh my god like this every meeting we were <laughs> we, we were like this changing the people changed all the time we never knew who was in charge who was not in charge the executive producer do you remember victoria then she she was completely she was really trying to make it happen then she was she had some issues with, I don't know whether with the government or with the broadcaster, we never understood it. So she was fired or she was kept away. And that was, and she was the only one who had some knowledge about all the mechanism of the Eurovision. She had like a massive experience about the Eurovision and she was completely put aside. And we had meetings in Russian only with translators. Yeah. I think that's kind of, it's it, this is like what you said it's kind of like uh, stigmatizing for this region even central europe if i don't count count Aust- austria just the ex soviet and satellites you know this eastern yeah, world it, i think this is this, this this is what we have to what we have to stop doing <laughs> i i would say like that i i i mean i think that then again uh the situation in ukraine was also peculiar because the country was a technically at war 
uh, with Russia. Uh, there was a lot of tension in the country. And as you can imagine, in those moments, Eurovision is not the priority. There was also a lot of fear that the Eurovision might be used as, you know, uh, let's say making the Eurovision fail would also be used politically from different forces within the country. So believe me, it was a very stressful, it uh, was a very stressful year. For me, that was the most difficult, difficult year, year ever. The other years were, were slightly, I mean, the years in Sweden, they were so easy because they, they were already, already, I mean, I, I they, had, or they hosted in Malmo. So I, I, I joined the, the reference group in Malmo, actually, when the Eurovision was almost set. So when they had to do it in, in Sweden, you know, it was like easy PC. They, they, they knew everything. They were super, super on, on track. And, but all, I, I say that all broadcasters were, all experiences they had were great, interesting. Tel Aviv was also a little bit challenging in the beginning. But also in the end, it was, it was, it, it went all super fine. And it was my last one and is the one that I cherish probably the most. That's so much fun. It, yeah, definitely. How hard it would be for Italy to host the Eurovision? And what would you expect of such drama? Or it's gonna be smooth? Or both of everything? I, well, I, you know, Rai, Rai is probably one of the biggest broadcasters that you have in DBU. Besides the BBC and and a little bit the Germans, uh, it's it's the most solid. And Rai is also very much skilled. One one of the uniqueness of Rai for such a large broadcaster is that we do a, an a, an impressive amount of production in house. So, Rai people can do that. I'm I'm hundred percent sure. Uh, there might be at the beginning some blah blah Italians love to be messy and talk and politics somebody some politician would all you know would everybody would would, like, would probably give their opinion unsolicited opinion about everything uh, but ultimately the show will be there I'm 100% sure so what, about is, the, what about the English that I yeah that might be an issue that might be but then again Italians Italians communicate no matter what it's like they don't you know, exactly, moving the hands and, you know, uh, and also Rai is changing. There are a lot of new, younger people in Rai now since I started. Uh, it's it's becoming more and more. There has been a generational sort of turnover in, in a way. Still, it's a very old, like any other broadcaster, public broadcaster in the country is very old, uh, let's say, in terms of um, average age of the employees. But things are getting better and people are becoming, the people who join are, they're such beautiful and smart young professional there. I'm sure they would pull a dream team to, 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 to make it. And, and I would like to say something else about this. It's completely idiotic, the mantra that there is around fans that Rai does not want to win. That Italy doesn't want to win. That Italy is... This thing has been haunted me since I started. It's not true. It is absolutely not true. Probably in the first years, there was a certain concern about winning, about something that nobody care of and, you know, have to put 20 millions or God knows how much for something that nobody cared. Um, now, situation is different. I think that also Rai, Rai executives are way more acquainted with the Eurovision, educated about the opportunity that the Eurovision might represent on a larger scale. So there is absolutely not concern about winning. Of course, it, it's a huge task. Though. It's like, sometimes there are some jokes when you say, we got second, better, best place. But this is something said more out of stupid comments. And unfortunately, these as, reflect, as reflected very poorly in the, with the record companies, because most of the record companies executive still think that we, the ride would sabotage not to win. Yeah, and I, don't know how to, I don't know how, how, how are you doing it, but you are successful in sabotaging it, you know. It, Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like. Look, if I, if I knew how to sabotage the results of the Eurovision, if anybody knew, believe me, everybody 
you know, you yeah, would. We probably have different you, winners, and we exactly know who I'm exactly. talking about. So, e exactly. And even so the, that country can't do it. So that's good. That's a good sign. Exactly. Exactly. So it's. Um, but you know, we have you have to live with stupid comments. So I I think that's the one of the biggest challenge of being head of delegation is living with stupid comments, unsolicited advice, all the time, every day. What was the stupid comments more coming from from fans in Italy or fans from abroad? How are, how how are fans in Italy about Eurovision? How 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 was it? Oh, they are they are. Then again, probably the fact that there is not such a huge legacy in the country, the fan community is more, to be honest, is more chilled than the rest. I've seen, for example, I've, I've seen, uh, for example, the fans in Spain, that are one of the most active community, they're completely crazy, they're completely angry all the time. It, Italian fans are not that hostile. But also because, then again, it... it the result, the results, and also the the singer is not chosen, to, you know, randomly by some executive in Rai. There's not a director in Rai that say he has to go because you know is a cousin of my sister's uh, lawyer. Uh, it doesn't work like this. So it's um, it, the the process. Say that the selection process is so transparent and so established that nobody would question it. So he wants a remo. So if he wins a remo, I mean, hands off. So he you know, wants a remo. So there is not this anger. The, the funny part for me was that I received, especially in the first years, I received an impressive amounts of private messages on my private channels. I, I was always being very open on my social media, so I wasn't hiding or blocking my profile. But there was a point in which... I, the first years I was trying to respond to everyone, trying to be to explain why we we're doing X or Y. There, you know, there are many more. At a certain point, I even stopped bothering because there were too many, and I find it quite crazy that that a, a fan reaches you and and tells you how to do your job. It's it, it's um, you know, I, I, sometimes I wonder what what, what mental process makes you think that you know you know better than than we do working on this extensively all year long what is possible what is not possible i mean it's not about just creative ideas it's about understanding that there are constraints that there are budget issues that there are limit technical limitations i mean there are so many things that you cannot do just whatever you want because it does the artist sometimes doesn't want to do things that might be good ideas because because he's an artist and you have to respect him. Um, so it's, and, and the amount of crazy messages, angry messages they get from fans. Why are you not doing these? Why in the staging are these? I've seen the first rehearsal that I God knows uh, the, sing the singer was wearing another shirt. I mean, I, I, I wanted, sometimes I wanted to say, get a life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, remember, I remember this happening a lot with those frames, you know, last year. We had those frames on stage and the fans were like, why the hell are you having frames? And then it was the first rehearsal and we didn't use this trick, you know, so they didn't see what, yeah. what was going to happen. And exactly. the frames are like, for it's just going to be blinking, blinking there or like, just, just, I, just no, relax. No, but, but, but you know, I use this knowledge of, uh, I actually love the passion of the fans around the project. It's not... It's not that common in TV industry and entertainment to have like such a community around something which is oh. which is online all the time, like whole year almost, you know, it works. It's it's somehow and it, it really inspired me to start this YouTube channel and to bring them the the views from the other side, you know, when we can freely talk even deeply about the problems we had or the issues we had or the whatever from the other yeah, side which is very different from from the fun perspective yeah, I, I, absolutely so don't get me wrong is not i i really um appreciate as you said the energy which is this community is pretty unique sometimes it can be overwhelming especially when 
when fans do not understand that is a little bit more complicated than it seems on the surface. But overall, overall, as I said, Italian fans have not been that aggressive. I mean, if I benchmark with other countries with experience that I've heard from other head of delegation or that I've personally seen, um, I think that Italians were quite cool, to be honest. But then again, we've been doing relatively well in, in, in the last few years, so there's, there's not a lot to complain, to be honest. <laughs> Is there something you would like to change in this decade? Where, where, where you think you could have done better or not better? Just, you know, oh, this was not a good step. Definitely wasn't a good, good step. Um, no, no. I think that all the, all the things that happened really were there rightly. So I think, I never think I had an injustice or um something that i i did wrong probably something that i wish would have gone differently and i think we would have thought differently in the beginning was when in copenhagen when emma participated and she rightly because i think we didn't guide there in the proper way we tried and then again if we, that was she's an, an incredible artist with so much charisma with such a, an amazing career in italy like one of the biggest we brought And I think we were trying to, then again, to look after some Eurovision cliché to make it more. And ultimately on stage, she wasn't what she is. She was uh, completely twisted or changed for a bigger... And the, 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 the concept per se, I think I was a very super creative and nice concept. But I think that ultimately the issue was that she didn't she, she didn't go to Eurovision being who she is because she's rock she's like a Gianna Nannini 2.0 uh and she this didn't translate on stage and i wish we had done that uh and and i think things would have probably gone a little differently uh but then again i i'm sad for her because she was really massacred in the italian media and she didn't deserve that Um, but besides that, I don't think we made many outstanding mistakes. We, we made mistake out of my an experience that year after year, uh, you know, probably got a little better. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, I, I think I did whatever I could with what we had in terms of and when i mean what we had meaning the availability of the record label and the artist to dedicate time to the eurovision so that was very limited we always worked in very super super tight few days to make this happen and this is why probably our staging was never overwhelming or was never like in line with a you know with a super production that that some other country brought and this is something that i I know I couldn't have done differently. I could not have done it differently with the framework that we had. Yeah, that's a good for our understanding. I think a lot of people I didn't understand. We we haven't talked about it uh before in such a detail. I never asked you probably as well. Maybe I was afraid to ask you because I think it's Why? kind of rude to tell to tell I Come on, come on. No, I mean I was, uh, No, you know, I'm I'm changing as well, you know. You you know you know by yourself that Those things, all of it, it's a process as well. And yeah. And for me, Eurovision was a like learning curve on so many levels that I just can't even tell for how, like how many, you know. And probably yeah. for all of us, for, yeah, for everybody us, I'm I talking think. to, it's it was a big change in everything. Pro probably professionally will be the best experience of my life. I mean, I will probably never forget this. Uh, so. I, you know, if I look back how much I've changed I mean I entered the Eurovision I was 30 and I get out at 40 so also as a man as a professional as you know you change so much between your 30 and your 40 you understand so much also about yourself that it, it, it's, it, it accompanied me it, it accompanied me through so much change and so much let's say inner growth that for me the Eurovision it will be always part of my life in, in a way in a way. I now I do something else, but 
I will always, al sorry, I will always, uh, always cherish what, what, what I've learned there. Yeah, that, no, that, that, that's something what, what I really believe that sometimes it's good to, to maybe leave it somehow and just let the experience to, to others exactly. as they will learn it as well. And I remember my first year was actually hard and I still think that was the best, ex like, eyes opening experience in so many on so many levels on so many levels that i can't even if i can't just get it from on out of my memory ever you know ever so um, many so i i will never forget my first year in Dusseldorf. i had no idea i was alone and i had no idea about the eurovision i had watched briefly before going to eurovision some past editions on DVD that EBU had kindly provided me with. Uh, but when I get to the stage, and I actually realized how much of things I needed to do, how many rehearsals, how many, uh, you know, collateral events and promotions and interviews. And I was like, I, uh, when I got back after Dusseldorf, I was like, I think it was one of the times I was most exhausted in my life. So I, I was drained, completely drained at the end of the two weeks in Dusseldorf. I can't imagine. I always had at least someone to help me out. So that, was, that, that alone. was great. There was one other question regarding Eurovision, which is a lot on my mind. I definitely want to talk about it in my like personal vlogs. So, so, but... Tell me. Uh, is that the big five thing as, again, and that's that the big five are automatically in the final. I completely understand why, that, that, and it's reasonable, I think. But do you think it's kind of a downside for for those countries? I, I know Italy can probably like go through the final anyway with this quality, but do you think it's something which definitely doesn't help to improve the other ones? That is a question that we've been discussed for many, many, many sessions of, of, the, of the reference group. And ultimately, the attempts in the last few years to include the big five in the semifinals in, in different ways, in, in a way that they could be more visible, more present, that, that they could not feel something alien that comes to the the final of the show this i think that we reached the limit of what it could be done without participating uh i don't think more than that could be done uh but then again this discussion has haunted the fans for many many years and it's, it's important to understand that spain italy uk uh, Germany and France represent, I think, more of the more of fifty percent of the TV viewership of the Eurovision. So the risk of not having those countries in the final means that the Eurovision becomes, on a larger scale, more irrelevant. Which means that sponsor will not pay the money that they pay now. Which means that the cost of the Eurovision will be higher for delegations and for the country. So it, it, sometimes I, I, I understand, I understand the, the, the point of view of small countries or things like this. I completely get it. I, and, and on the other hand, we have to make sure that this show stays. We had to make sure. And that on the other so hand, we still see some like acts which I think don't have the quality to go to the finals as well. So maybe it's irrelevant exactly. as well. Exactly. But, uh, but this, this don't probably, you think that's probably... a big responsibility for big five countries to, to step up a game and just be the drive core of... I, I, I'm not I, sure, I, like, I, so. I wouldn't say change, but you know. Yeah, make it, you know, make more efforts. I, I think I completely agree with you. And sometimes I was very say disappointed no but like a little perplexed about some choices uh, in, in some of the countries uh in some of the big five countries and i was saying like why are you sending this it's like can't you find something better but i 
I think that the biggest issue is the what I told you before about this negative spiral. So I I sense many I I, I know I've discussed it many times with my fellows uh, Big Five uh, Edward delegation about this, and they cannot. I mean, it seems that they cannot manage to to to. To, to you know to reverse France was trying Eduardo I think did a great job yeah I think so yeah uh, but then things didn't go that well then they wanted to do the national selection in France and then you know it, it is difficult it is a very difficult job but I really hope and I really wish for the big five to 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 step up to be honest uh, because there's so much opportunity uh for artists especially of in, in larger markets that can you know benefit from these and and also promote the european cultural industry you know that is so dominated by american american music that i think we we could do so much about it that it's a pity and they are actually their local markets are super strong when when you just show like look what what it's released every day it's the quality exactly. is really good. So there's probably exactly. something problem in between the market and the TV, yeah. I think. And it's, of course, more complicated yeah. than that. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of, let's say, um, industry. It's an industry issue. Relations between broadcaster and the record industry, that is very complicated. It's very troublesome. So it's, uh, and then again, it suffers from the legacy. But I, I, I think they need to take a few risks for a couple of years. And and build from that, especially when there are automatically in the finals. That I agree. Exactly. Uh, uh, the last question was about to be uh, just the joy, you know, to 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 tell me the best memory you had from Eurovision. But uh, that just 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 really briefly tell me how immigration helped or didn't help the Italian industry, because like Mahmoud, he's the son of immigrants. Or so so how how uh, how this theme is taken in Italy regarding the music industry? But I mean, I think that in music, it, nobody cares where you are from and what what you have. The the music scene now is full of second generation artists of other cultures and. So I wouldn't mix, let's say, the biggest immigration problems that we have. No, 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 no. I, I was really thinking, like this immigration influence in Italy. Is, is I, I, I think diversity. I think diversity helps every time. Diversity helps because it brings a different perspective. It different brings something new, something new that can merge with, with the Italian flair. Because Alessandro, as um, Mahmoud, it's Italian hundred percent. I mean. It, if you talk to him, he's purely Milanese, like 100% Milanese. He doesn't even speak Arabic. So um, he knows some words, something, but it's, it's just, but of course his culture is, let's say, his, his artistic path has been deeply influenced by Arabic sounds, by the music his father was listening when he was a kid. So this brings such a unique perspective as ultimately he was unique. I think is was very new, very fresh in in a way of bringing things. So, culture definitely, definitely. Sorry, diversity definitely, definitely, definitely brings a much better perspective, a much, much more options on the table. Yeah, I'll just give you one option of one unique memory I would like you to share with me regarding Eurovision. If you just can pick one, I know there's millions. If you just can pick one, I have one. I have one for sure. I will never forget this. Um, was Dusseldorf again? It was the green room. I, I don't think you were there in in Dusseldorf still. The green room in Dusseldorf was gigantic, and I didn't know because then again I was a little bit Alice in Wonderland in, in Dusseldorf. So I I think I I didn't even know what the green room was. I was like completely lost. <laughs> and in a moment, it was built in a stadium. In a stadium, we have. 35,000 seats though. And the green room in a, in a certain moment was behind the, the massive screen that they had. And we were sitting in a green room, green room thinking that this would still 
you know, that that was the green room and that's it, they will come with cameras. And at a certain moment on the, on, on the voting show, the, on the voting show, when, when, sorry, when the voting starts, the screens opens like this and we were sitting in the green room and in front of you, you had the whole stadium like this of 35,000 people screaming, shouting, confetti, applause. Believe me, I was like this in, in, in my seats because I, I, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know the mechanism. I didn't know that this was about to happen. And I, I, I froze for, 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 a, you know, for five minutes, I was looking at this like, this is amazing. This is like the, the biggest things I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen that in a TV show with such a big, it was a really big stadium. So um, I think I will never forget it. It was a mix, a mixture between innocence on my end and, uh, you know, and the super production that they, that they were pulling out, pulling off. So uh, chapeau to, to, to the German. Yeah, that was a awesome memory for the end of our Awesome conversation, I'm really glad we have met after a year, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And... I'm really happy to, to, have, to have had a chat with you. I hope that what I said was interesting. Were, was interesting. For me it was. Let's see, for the viewers, I don't know. I, I have bored the viewership. <laughs> I'll put you know I'll put some I'll put some song you know underneath so it's gonna be more like freshy. No, I think it was cool, man. If you want to mute me and, and put some music behind, I think it's better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. And if I put some music there, it's gonna be probably Mahmoud, whatever from his album, which is which is just awesome. So uh, thank you very much for the conversation, and see you next time. Stay safe. Ciao. Thank you.